Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, your host, and our focus is on mastering communication as an essential leadership skill so that you can command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal in any context. My guest this week is Katie Bussing. Katie is the Chief Human Resources Officer of the Springfield Clinic. She's been in this role for nine years with a total of 17 years in human resources leadership experience. Previously, she was in the oil and gas as well as the building industries. She's also the mom of three kids, ages 10, 8, and 5. And for the last two years, Springfield Clinic has been listed on the Newsweek Top 100 Most Loved Workplaces that's an impressive stat. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Appreciate you having me. Now, tell us before we kick off, what's a fun fact? Okay. So I, I thought about this quite a bit on the fun fact I want to share. And the most unique one that I have is I actually was featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Ooh. But in saying that, I want to be very clear, I was an actress on Unsolved Mysteries. The episode was not about me. <laughs> the subject so, of an episode. I was not, yes, I was not the the person that they were after or talking about, but just, yeah, I, I was, um, I acted in one of the episodes for the show. That is definitely an important distinction. I'm kind of glad you clarified that now because <laughs> I wouldn't have thought about that. And I'm going, how many emails would I have gotten afterwards? Going uh -huh. Are you so sure you wanted to have her on the show? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And you were not just playing the dead body where it's being scrolled, run off the screen on a gurney someplace. No. You had a speaking role. I was the daughter of the person that they were focused on. Yeah. So what, was it fun? It was fun. It was a great time. So, nice. Nice. That's yeah. Nice. Being able to see on a resume. So I love it. It's yeah. Fun and different. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about Springfield Clinic. What's your 30 second elevator pitch? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Springfield Clinic, we are the largest multi-specialty healthcare organization in central Illinois. We have about 700 physicians and events practitioners. We are in about, I would say, 90 locations, uh, give or take a little bit. So we are very much a growing organization. We've been around for 80 plus years. I would say our biggest focus here at Springfield Clinic is really how we provide a differential patient experience and making sure that we are always about the patient and providing that great patient care. So uh, we're very proud of the fact that we have um, national rank in the top 10th percentile um, for great patient experience. So something we're very proud of here. That's amazing. And you mentioned specialty clinics. What's the specialization? Uh, all kinds of specialties. So we have over 80 different oh, wow. uh, multi-specialties. So cardiology, endocrinology, you name it, um, a broad spectrum. And what's something that you wish more people understood either about your role, your company, or your industry? And what is your personal role in changing this perception? Yeah, so uh, healthcare, no no secret that that's definitely been a, a challenging time over the past several years with COVID, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, but I would say just as far as for me, particularly something that has been um, just challenging or you know changing perception, I joined the clinic about nine years ago, and we had a much smaller HR function at that point in time. And it was a, a great HR team for what the clinic was 10 years ago. Um, a few decentralized processes, um, but supported the organization just fine. But we have grown so much in the past 10 years that uh, I've really been tasked with and had the challenge of changing the perception here at Springfield Clinic on what the HR function can do mm. and the value it can serve to the organization. So, um, you know, you don't just ha pop down to us to maybe submit a, a 401k change or something like that, but rather how we can really serve as a proactive strategic function in partnering with the business, understanding what needs to get done and really partnering with you to make sure it gets done. So it's definitely been a change here at the clinic um, as far as how many people we have on the team and the types of support and roles that we do. Um, but definitely it's, it's been a work in progress. What's, what was the journey? If you can summarize it in just, you know, a, a couple of sentences, as far as shifting the mindset, how did, why did it matter? Well, I think it mattered for a couple different reasons. I mean, I would say when I joined the clinic, you know, certainly someone would call and say, I need to do this or I need to, um, you know, go ahead and put this advertisement out for my new hire. I need help with recruitment or I need to put together a job offer. Mm -hmm. um, and those are all types of things that we do in the HR function. Absolutely. Um, so it's not just going ahead and continuing to deliver those basic services, but also know how do we as an HR function partner with you to 
you know, build this service line? And what's the staffing plan as we build the service line? It's important because we don't just want to be a reactive support function, but rather a key partner who's there helping drive the change and being in front of the change as well. So it sounds like you're went from being just an auxiliary kind of paper oriented, or we've made our decisions now tell HR to do their thing to bring in HR to help make the decisions. That's what we've been working towards more. Yeah. So, and, and as I said, you know, at Springfield Clinic, we've grown so much in the past several years. So the HR function that was in place before, they did a great job supporting where Springfield Clinic was at the time. But as we've continued to grow and grow so quickly, HR needed to take on a different approach and a different role in supporting the organization. And then from there, did you ever think you did a great job of explaining something only to have the listener look at you like a deer in the headlights? Oh, yes. <laughs> I would say I've had that a few times. So, um, yeah, I would say when I first became the CHRO at Springfield Clinic, I I definitely had some of those learning moments. Um, there's one in particular that always kind of sticks with me. It was the first time I ever presented to the board of directors here at the clinic. And, you know, I'm nervous and I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm doing a good job and come across as knowledgeable, et cetera. Um, the particular situation was we were rolling out a new life and disability program. We partner with a group um, called the Summit Group of Virginia, and I they spent so much time prepping me for this board meeting on every detail of the new life and disability program. And just the hours I spent prepping for this when in reality, you know, I should have done a better job on what does the board of directors truly need to know. They're not going to sit here and drill me on the waiting period of a new program versus more. How much does it cost? Why are we doing it? Why does it benefit employees? Why does it benefit the organization? What's best practice? And are we moving in the right direction? And so I just look back on that now because um, just my mentality going into it. Um, I was definitely prepared, but with way more detail than I ever needed versus just really keeping my eye on what's the true focus of a board of directors. So, And that's so challenging and yet so common, especially A, for the first time people are speaking with the board for themselves, but yeah. also just as a general practice of who's the audience and remembering yep. to double check. And it's often something we don't know to ask. We're so used to presenting to a, a particular group, uh, whether it's a role, a function, a, a whatever it is, but then we know what's helped us be successful in communicating with that audience. And we forget that not everybody else is as excited about the same details. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And my board of directors are a group of physicians, right? They're there to provide patient care. And so they really don't want to hear me ramble on about every single detail about a life and disability program. <laughs> so. Did you get feedback from them or did you just sort of figure it out for yourself or did you get feedback from somebody else? You know, I think in that particular situation, um, I was very good at reading the room in the moment. So while I, my mentality going into the meeting was, you know, this and this and this, and make sure you hit all these details very quickly, just picking up on the room and okay, I, they don't need that. And let's just shift back to why are we doing this? How much does it cost? Why is it value added to Springfield Clinic? And why as independent owners and partners of the clinic, would they want to do this and keeping the focus there? So there's, those are two different skills. And I think it's really impressive that you had both in that moment. One is to just, A, read the room and go, note to self, yes or no, is this working? Clearly, no, let's make a shift. But then knowing what to shift to, I think so many people do have that first piece where they go, I'm not connecting, I, I, something's off, I'm just, I'm not getting a good vibe out of this. But then they don't know where to go with it. And you figured out, I'm in the weeds they don't want to be in the weeds. They need right. to know the why. They want to know the strategic vision. They want to know, is this the right direction? And you were able to assess that so quickly. How was there anything in your brain that made you identify that's what I should be doing, not just that other thing's not what I should be doing? Because that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. And I think it depends on the scenario, too. I mean, I, I think that's something I anytime I present to the board of directors now where I'll come with a high level pieces of information that yeah. I think they want to know. I always do a little bit of prep work in the background, talk to a, a physician or two on what types of questions do you have on this? So I do that prep work before the board. But once you're up there and in the moment, um, you never know what, what things they may have more focus on than others. And um, if I ever get lost, I just pause and I say, are there any you know high level pieces of information that I'm not hitting for you right now? Is there anything you're wondering about that maybe I haven't addressed yet? And we can backtrack and I, I can hit those too. Um, so I don't have a problem just pausing and 
pulse checking the room. Um, and if I get blank stares and, and then I go ahead and I just lead with, again, what do I think are the most important things for them to know um, in order to make an educated decision? So, And that's just as important, the ability to, to pause in the moment and just ask the question and say, what, am I, what do you need? that I'm not providing, as opposed to hitting the panic button. So I think a lot of right. people would potentially ask the question, but almost cower in doing so. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm doing, I'm missing it. So how do, I'm so sorry. I, it doesn't look like I'm yeah. getting, I don't, I don't, I don't sense that I'm doing like what you want or, I don't know, is there something else? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The over apology all over the place. And yep. you just went, you know, that's, so you tell me, here's what I presented. What else do you need? How can I serve you? Exactly. So, and, and you'll find too, at least I found, and sometimes in that situation, you'll have a physician or two that recognizes, you know, and they go ahead and nod and give you the confirmation of you've hit it. Like, thank you. We're good. Or nope. Can you steer us this way? So um, it's, it's just nice to get that additional confirmation. Yeah. And it's good to build a relationship over time where you've now done it. Who knows how many times over the last nine years that you've been there. So that a makes lot. it easier. You build <laughs> So you have the rapport, mm -hmm. you know how to read their faces. They'll just, I assume some of them will just interject when they have got a oh, yeah. or something. They're not shy. Uh, yes, no. And no. you know that if they ask a question, it's not like them hitting the Acme trapdoor button from the Roadrunner cartoons kind of a thing. They're not going to shoot you out. Uh, it's it's just okay. I have questions. It's, and it's a dialogue. It's a conversation. So there's that yeah. comfort, which is great. And you know what? That you're right. They're not hesitant to to throw out whatever question they may have. They can get you know more detailed questions sometimes, um, and that's where and everyone says this, and it's so true. But do not give a wrong answer. It is okay to say I do not know that at this particular moment, off the top of my head. I will circle back around with you, but but then circle back around like within the next 24 yes. hours and, and give them the answer. <laughs> yes. Yes. Don't but, make it up. They'll yeah, know if you're shocked. Do not make it up. Yes. So then you got to go back and contradict yourself and correct yourself. And it's just worse. Just don't even go there. Yeah. Hip boots are not a good accessory for board meetings. I, I generally no, find no. <laughs> a general Let's consensus. Try and stay clear of that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Love it. Now, when have you allowed yourself to be emotionally vulnerable with your team and how did it impact your relationship with them moving forward? Yeah, you know, I have um, I have a really close knit team, but it, it definitely took some time to develop that rapport and and trust with each other. And I I think part of that too is just being open and honest with each other. I, no one does everything perfect. We all have different pressures in life. I believe you mentioned earlier at the beginning of the podcast. Um, you know, I, I'm a single mom. I have three kids. They're ten, eight, and five, and it can be hard sometimes. You know, um, juggling being an executive role and a healthcare organization and, and being a mom. And, and sometimes you just have those days where you feel like you're feeling it both. And, um, you know, I, I had a particular morning where I walked into work and I had a one-on-one -on -one with a member of my team and he was all excited to, to hit something with me. And I, I did, I just had to look at him and say, I am so sorry, but you do not have my attention right now. Mm. And I had the worst morning and, XYZ happened and I just started crying. <laughs> I was like, I'm not being a good HR exec right now. I'm not being a good mom right now. I'm failing at everything. And um, we, we got to zero of his topics that morning, but he definitely let me just vent and um, air some frustrations and also help support me in that. No, I wasn't feeling it both. Um, I'm just human. And I, I guess my point in that story is, you know, when I'm vulnerable with the team, they feel comfortable being vulnerable and return with me too. I always want them to be honest with me. If they're struggling with something, I want them to talk to me about it. I can't help if I don't know what's going on. Right. Um, and vice versa. So. And did you, was there any direct um, observation that you could make as far as how he related with you afterwards or a way that you were able to then get more people to open up to you have, having now then modeled it? Yeah. I mean, and I think you can see the change in demeanor right away too. I mean, here I was with my direct report and he's ready to present something out to me and, you know, obviously has done his homework and ready to go and um, almost had his game face on, right? And was ready to present. And then after I just basically said, halt, you know, <laughs> you don't have my attention right now. You just saw him kind of relax and have him go, oh, Katie, like, what's going on? <laughs> just talk to me. Um, so again, it's just being able to take down those barriers and, and chat with your team and we're all in it together. So uh, I don't know if you hear the phrase a lot, but you know, 
we try and be a basketball team, not, mm-hmm. not a group of golfers. And uh, we're here to support each other. So Yes, yes. We need everybody to be on the court working together, yep. shooting towards the same basket. Not that I don't like golf, but it, it's great, but <laughs> no, it's <laughs> not it here. Is, it, right, right. But everybody playing, okay, against each other and against yourself, which is also part of the challenge of golf for the handful of times that I have pitifully wielded a club, if I'm going to be completely honest with myself. I, but, uh, you could say you're playing against yourself, but you're still showing up on your own. Nobody's going to help you out on that one. There so you go. That's a, that's a very lonely game. But what about a time when you needed to assert yourself powerfully? I would say a time I needed to assert myself powerfully, uh, really hold my own is really as we are continuing to navigate COVID as an organization, you know, just like several other organizations, we really were um, challenged financially and really needed to make good decisions to make sure we are in the best financial position as an organization. And so we'd have a lot of conversations as an executive team, as a, a physician, physician owned group on where do we cut? And we had, held on merit increases and held on profit sharing for one year. And the discussion came up again, what do we do for that next year? And I think just the natural reaction was, will we go ahead and hold on that because we're not in the best financial, we're not out of it just yet. And it was something where I had to speak up and work with my team too on say, guys, let's just pause and let's keep in mind the bigger picture. We've had employees who have been here each and every day on the front lines continuing to deliver patient care, following different protocols that they haven't. It it was a stressful time in healthcare. And we'd already done one year of holding on merits and profit sharing. And so really, as a team, talking about how can we shift our mindset from just holding to let's take care of our employees and where can we cut elsewhere? Yes. And how was it received? Um, I mean, definitely there's some banter back and forth on, okay, well, where do we, where do we cut then? Um, but at the end of the day, I don't think any of us, you know, questioned the decision walking out of the room because we all knew we were taking care of our staff who had been putting in hours and hours of work over the past couple of years. Right. And of, I mean, of all industries, look, everybody was stressed. Everybody was stretched thin. Everybody was under budget crunches during COVID, but where everybody else was doing their best to figure out how to stay far away from those who were sick. Anybody in healthcare, of course, was running right into the fire. So yep. uh, yeah, definitely need to pay the people when in doubt. So that's pay great people, that you were able yeah. to make sure that everybody received what they, what they really knew that they were due. Um, and, Natural conversation, but good for the rest of the leadership team to come around so quickly on that one as well. Well, Katie, I think this is a great opportunity to shift gears into challenging our listeners, not just talking about past challenges, but let's talk about the listener 24-hour influence challenge of the day. This is a chance for you to talk directly to our audience and challenge them to take one step that they can complete within 24 hours to have more influence. So how would you like to challenge our listeners today? Yeah. So, well, first of all, thank you for taking the time to listen in a day and and my 24 hour hour my 24 hour challenge would be to and uh, reach out to someone you don't know in your organization uh, maybe you don't know their position maybe you don't know them very well as an individual but go have coffee with them learn a little bit about them personally and then go job shadow them for an hour or two um, I I try and do that um, on a regular basis here at the clinic and um, I find it's very um, time well spent. And so that'd be my challenge. You're going to learn something new. You're going to make a new professional connection. And um, it also shows that as a leader, you're, you're willing to take the time to get out there and, and know your team. And the give me a couple of examples of different roles that you've shadowed. Oh, gosh. Um, anything to I've taken a day and, and shadowed one of our physicians in primary care. So I'm in and and seeing the patient, if, if they're OK with it and they consent, um, to I will sit with a position that we call our PAS, and really it's the it's the first position you see when you walk into the clinic. We check you in, we take your insurance cards, um, different systems that they're working through. So um, sitting and spending four hours with them on learning how they process the insurance and check people in and make sure that the patient's having a good experience. So all types of roles. Really understanding what people on your team and otherwise are are experiencing and how everybody else just recently uh, we had someone else, Jonathan Reed was one of our guests and uh, he, his question was anybody you see in from your company, ask them how their role affects the patient's 
or excuse me, the, the client, the customer experience. Yes. And this is such a great example of how to do that in, in spades. I mean, this is not just a little one, but that's it's huge to be able to truly experience somebody else's job for an hour or even 15 minutes for that matter. Absolutely. What and I encourage learned? people to shadow me too. Um, you know, one of my favorite stories is I had a member of the HR team. So I also, I do coffee with Katie, um, which sounds kind of silly, but it works. Um, <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's just my way of having some one-on-one -on -one time with each member of the HR team here at the clinic. And, um, you know, I, I had a, a young gentleman who was newer to the organization and he sat down and he looked at me and he goes, so what? do you really do every day? Like, do you just sit here? And <laughs> um, so I told him, I was like, why don't you come job shadow with me for a day? And you, you can see what I do as well. So I think it works both ways too. And what's, what's the biggest eye-opening experience you had when shadowing somebody else? I think it just depends on the role. Um, you know, I think it's always interesting when you job shadow in other departments at least when I go, I have the lens of, okay, well, how can my department do something differently or better to better help support that department? Mm. And so it's just, it's nice to get out of your own little silo and see things from their perspective. You know, you may have a leader who, from an HR perspective, you're frustrated because maybe they didn't complete their performance evaluation on time or whatever the scenario may, may be. Yeah. But when you, when you get out of your um, HR uh, silo and go sit with them, you see how they're scrambling back and forth, making sure the operations are running smooth, providing that great patient care and just so many different things that are on their plates gives you a little bit better understanding of why maybe they didn't get the performance evaluation done right away. So well, I'm inspired by the challenge. So hopefully everybody else is too. And, and I'm guessing you inspire a lot of people. So tell me about a time when you needed to inspire others and how did that go? Yeah. So I, I actually, uh, when you sent these questions over for me to think about ahead of time. I, I was a little stumped on this one. Um, I, I just kind of paused. I was like, gosh, I, I don't know if I really consider myself inspirational and if so, what I do to inspire people. So I reached out to a few people on my team and I, I said, well, first of all, don't lie to me. If I don't inspire you, don't, don't tell me that I do. Um, but if I do, would you mind sharing with me how? And um, so I, I have an individual on my team and she, she's been with me for about seven years now and such great potential. And, but her, her biggest downfall was she always doubted herself. Mm. And the way she said that I inspired her was just continuing to push her, see the potential that she has, um, giving her projects where maybe she was doing the higher level work without necessarily taking on the title and not to prove it to me or the organization, but really just to prove to herself that she can do it. And um, so she's a, a director here at the organization. And gosh, seven years ago, she, I remember her looking me in the eye saying she, she didn't even want to be a, a manager. And mm. so it's just, it's really cool to see how much she's grown over the past several years. Oh, that's beautiful. To, and I love that you just asked people because I think so often we're afraid to ask for any feedback, constructive feedback, positive feedback. You know, tell me something I'm doing well for you. Tell me something that I could do to improve. Tell me how I can help you more. Tell me how I can do this or that. But what's working? Not just what's yeah. not. Without feeling well, like you're compliment fishing. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you got to be ready to take the bad too. So I don't always love everything I hear. <laughs> so, well, that's part of the job. But that's part of the job. And, you know, I think at that point in time, you can reflect. And is it something you need to adjust? Is it something you just keep your eye on? Is it something, um, no, this is part of my, and, you know, that's just the way it is. So, um, but if, if you're not willing to hear it, you can't reflect on it. And um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, they're, they're here working for you and, and, I'm a big believer you have to enjoy the person and the people you work with. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. It changes so. the day, the experience of absolutely every day when you truly enjoy the, the, the company that you keep. It just absolutely makes you want to get out of so. bed in the morning. Now, yes. in the past, when you've interviewed candidates, speaking of coworkers and, and direct reports and everybody else, when you've interviewed somebody for a leadership role within your organization, have you ever thought this person has it? What was that it factor and how did you recognize it? Yeah. Uh, so being in HR, we interview a ton um, for a lot of different positions. And, you know, I'm one of those people where, yes, I can look at a resume and, 
yes, I can sit here and, and weigh in on the required skill sets. But really, at the end of the day, when I'm talking to someone, whether it's a formal interview or even just a casual meet and greet, um, I, and this is a very not technical term, but do they have the right stuff? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I had a leader who used to say that all the time all the time, you know, do they have the right stuff? And it stuck with me. And the right stuff to me is, do they have the drive? Do they have the ability? And do they have the passion? Um, and and if so, can then give them a chance to come in and do the job. You know, we had a, a director position we hired for, I don't know, probably about five years ago now, maybe six, um, where some of the team was resistant to bring him on board because he didn't have healthcare experience. Mm. Oh, well, he doesn't know this acronym or, and that's okay. He can learn them. Yeah. I was new to healthcare at one point in time too. Um, and he has turned out to be one of the best marketing professionals we have brought into this organization. Uh, he's been promoted here and, and now serves on our executive team. And and what a miss it would have been if we didn't hire him simply because he didn't have healthcare experience. So um, he that's why I just, he had the stuff. Yep. And you could sense the passion or you could sense what, what were the, the, the stuff boxes that you just sensed right away from that? Yeah. Interview? Yeah. It's the drive. It's the passion. It's having the smarts. It's the you know ability to work well with others. And again, I, I don't look at it as, well, you haven't done this before, so you can't versus more. Do you have the ability and the want and the drive and the smarts to learn it? And, and they come in and they do. So yes. How scrappy are you? Are you willing? Do you have enough scrappy? Foundation? I like the word scrappy. <laughs> I'm going to start using that one more. <laughs> I think that's a really important technical term that is utterly underused. You know, it's, it's I'm going to define scrappiness as enough foundational skill and knowledge to be able to figure out whatever else you need to figure out and the willingness to go and figure it out. Yes. Well, and actually, this is kind of funny that this word came up because one of my first um, bosses ever out of school, he, he described me as scrappy. <laughs> like, you're kind of scrappy, Katie. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he'll, he'll get a kick out of this. <laughs> see, there you go. You send him the link and say, see, I'm going to wear this there you go. badge of honor. Uh-huh. I love it. Scrappy and a proud. <laughs> love a flag for that made one of these. There you go. The scrappiness flag. It's a badge of honor. So yeah. finally, Katie, what's something that you do to create a little bit more fun for your team? Yeah, we um, we we are a work hard, play hard type of department. Um, and I I really try and always keep that on the forefront. We we have our top operating principles as an HR function. And it, it's kind of silly, but number 10 is have fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's important. Again, you spend so much time at work. You know, I, I want people to be motivated. I want them to produce results, but I also want them to enjoy being here. And the happier they are, um, the better we work together as a team and the better yes, the results ma'am. we have as a department. So, you know, we do anything from happy hours here or there to a game night to once a month we do HR huddles where um, we don't necessarily hit work updates, but we more just celebrate each other, call out kudos, who has birthdays, who has anniversaries, who has a funny story. Um, it's just our time to to be friends and human with each other. And so um, I, I feel like we we do it a fair amount here and in the HR team. And it doesn't have to be huge, right? It can be larger things and events and happy hours, and it can be something more internal. It can be the games, can be, if there was a, you mentioned the word kudos, and it just I had a flashback to there was an event I attended where when the the trainer was um you know would call on different people for certain things and if they felt like the the person gave a really good example or or successfully completed task whatever it was do you remember it was I don't know maybe 15 years ago in the granola bar and protein bar section they used to have kudos bars I that loved kudos great. bars. <laughs> Those are so good. The chocolate covered ones. Of course. That was their, yes. to eat? No, they weren't. That was how they yes. got eaten and yes. still called quote unquote granola bars. They were candy bars. Yes. Well, let's face they it. Were they were candy bars really and they good. were delicious. Yeah. yeah. So they had, a okay, I need, I need, I need to track some of those down. I don't know if they still make them. I haven't take them and hand them out at the HR town halls. But there you go. They, so, had the I know. they would just hand out kudos to as the congratulations are well done instead of a handshake or a sticker or something along those lines. And I like it. Was, it. I, I'm going to try and hunt those down. Bars. Yeah. Well, I, I understand they're good. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, Katie, much as I'm sorry to have to bring this to an end, I would give you a kudos if I had them anywhere. If you find them, please let me know where you found I them. I will keep you posted on that. <laughs> How can people learn more about you and Springfield Clinic? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you ever want to get in touch with me, I'm on LinkedIn. So please reach out. Just send me a, a message through LinkedIn. You can learn more about the clinic at any point in time. Go to our website. We have um, a page too if you're ever interested in employment here. Um, we'd love to hear from you if you have a passion for providing great patient care. We're a growing organization. We're, we're fast paced right now. And it's just an exciting time to be here. So yeah, if you have any interest at all, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and we'll get you in the right hands. Perfect. Well, Katie, it's been lovely to speak with you today. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And to everybody else out there, of course, thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice so we can help even more people to increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.